of Georgia. He's a former Hubert Humphrey Fellow at Boston University. He worked for the United Nations in New York. He holds an MSc degree in journalism and an MA in P and PhD rather in international studies. He is author of the United States and a United Nations Congressional Funding and UN Reforms. Professor Ben Bongang, you are welcome to the program. Just hold on and we will go with this reflection. Here is the reflection for this Sunday by yours sincerely. It's really just hot off the press. Hello and welcome to the broadcast of this 17th day of November. And while I do that, let me switch over now so that Reverend Pam can see my little face. I believe she is seeing me now. Okay. Oh my God, oh my goodness. Okay, today, November 17th, is actually the 321st day of the year in the Gregorian calendar. Okay, Hello. there. So it is 321st day of the year in the Gregorian calendar. That means that we have just 44 days left until 2019 is out. Back in history on November 17, 1869, the Suez Canal opened, linking the Mediterranean and the Red Seas, and of course, shortening the travel distance from Europe through the, uh, the, get, uh, the Cape of Good Hope to Asia. In 2003, Austrian-born Arnold Schwarzenegger was born in, uh, was rather sworn in, not born, was sworn in as governor of California, and not to leave the continent of Africa out, in 1855, David Livingston became the first European to see what we call today the uh, Lake Victoria. That lake that separates Zimbabwe and uh, or lies around Zimbabwe and Zambia. So our topic, why don't we get started? I believe things are working right. Reverend Pamia, you can confirm that. So our topic, freedom of speech, turns out to have been the most difficult for me to write a reflection about. But I got inspiration sitting in my pew this morning and being guided by a reading from Luke 21, five to 19. A phrase that caught my attention from that reading. And I'm going to paraphrase it. By your perseverance, you will save your profession. Well, I happen to be a journalist Professor Bonga happens to be a journalist, so we will save our profession through our perseverance. This reading was talking about the end times in a way, so we will save our profession no matter the odds. That is so true, especially for those whose profession puts them in the trenches of society. Those men and women who foray through street corners and palaces to glean facts, prepare informative and educative exposés called information. On their minds is a desire to inform and educate and entertain. That brings us around to today's topic again, if I can keep repeating myself. What is it and why is it so important that freedom of speech should deserve a place on a discussion like this? That is the $1 million question that we are all grappling with and that we are all gathered today or we joining shortly to tackle. Almost every piece of literature on the topic tells us that the most important or the, the most basic thing to learn from the phrase is that of freedom of speech. And that means the right to express any opinion without censorship or restraint. From a legal standpoint, we learn that it is, quote, the right to express information, ideas, and opinions free from government restrictions based on content and subject <coughs> only to reasonable limitations as the power of the government to avoid a clear and present danger, especially as guaranteed by the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. So no matter how we call it or define it, freedom of speech and all the other freedoms mentioned in the First Amendment to the US Constitution is a fundamental human right that, quote, reinforces all other human rights, allowing society to develop and progress, and of course. Freedom of speech or freedom of expression is important because we cannot afford a society of the dumb. 
wherein the inhabitants see nothing, feel nothing, hear nothing, and say nothing. Such a society would not survive because it is only by seeing, feeling, talking about issues that we as a community can truly live the full meaning of our being people, that is human beings, ready to challenge the challengeable and prepared to go the full nine yards to make our existence complete. Therefore, the ability to express our opinion and speak freely is essential to bring about change in society. Yes, free speech is important for many reasons, and we must use that freedom as best as we can. Be that as it may, freedom of speech does not mean that one says just anything, anywhere, and anyhow. Freedom of speech means that someone's right to say something is protected within certain limits. A person may have to suffer consequences for saying some things, but they still have the right to say those things responsibly and ready to bear the consequences if need be. On that note, I will conclude this by saying, by your, professional, by your professionalism, by your informed and educated speech, by your truthfulness, you shall make your point, convince your audience, and tell your story without fear of harassment or persecution. It may not actually be so in our world today, but there cannot be a retreat or surrender by those sworn into what many have come to call or describe as journalism. Journalists are and still will always remain the tireless foot soldiers in the societal trenches, sacrificing fame and reward and determined to educate, entertain, distract and inform a world ever faced by the strains and stresses of its own unending chores. As the late Senator Robert Kennedy put it, hand in hand with freedom of speech goes the power to be heard, to share in the decisions of government which shape men's lives. At this point, dear listeners, dear participants, our special guest, Professor Bongang, the table is now laid bare, the lunch is served, can we engage it? <laughs> Professor Ben Bongan, what is your take on freedom of speech? Give the firing shot, I mean the opening shot, so we can get this going. Over. Uh, thank you, Asong, uh, for that uh, brilliant uh, writer. Uh, I think we, since we are broadcasting from the United States of America, I would like to begin by framing the idea of freedom from the, uh, from the American perspective. As you rightly said, uh, the first amendment to the constitution started with the, that Congress shall make no laws to abridge freedoms. And in this case, freedom of expression and of the press. Uh, therefore, uh, first of all, why did they get to that? They got to that because the first three articles of the United States Constitution, to some were good enough. They already uh, excluded the idea of a monarchy that they had fought. So, but others said that they were not going to sign on to this document unless there were express freedoms that stated what government cannot do. That was very important because to, to those who were fighting for, for the Bill of Rights, if the constitution had led to stand, it could also create a new uh, type of autocracy where the elite, those who are running the government could create something close to a monarchy. So the Bill of Rights expressly were to, to stop government from infringing on individual rights. That's why the first one begins with the, uh, the expression of rights. Now, there are today in, in the discussions about freedom of expression, those we call absolutists. And absolutists means they are reading word for word what is in the constitution. And to them, there should not be any limits to an individual's freedom to express themselves. But there are those who said, 
The second group, we will call them those who uh, suggest that they, it, when you talk about freedoms, there must be automatically some limits to the exercise of freedom. For instance, before 1791, when uh, the Bill of Rights was passed, there were already some laws against uh, libels, against uh, obscenity. So therefore to them, there is no reason why there should not be limits to, to freedom. For instance, today in the United States, there are laws against obscenity. There are laws against uh, libel. There are laws against what we call fighting words. There are laws against criminal solicitation. There are laws against hate speech. It's, and also called, uh, recently, there is a lot that has been talked about and there are laws against sexual harassment. Therefore, when you look from the American perspective, there are all these freedoms but when you go to the law books, you see that as society has evolved, there have been challenges to freedoms in the sense that if you are in, in your exercise of freedom, you infringe on my freedom or if you infringe on what I would call the freedom of the common good, that is of the country. Therefore, those freedoms, your freedoms will be limited. That, that, that let's, uh, uh, continue the discussion and we can go into details about that because other countries have different ways of discussing the idea of human freedoms or freedom of the of uh, expression and especially freedom of the press Sylvia at this point I think you have uh, you are itching to say something go right ahead and say it <laughs> it's always itching to say something <laughs> yes I know her yes oh, Lord. Hello, I just wanted to say hello to our guest uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, your contribution. Uh, but Doc, let me just make one historical correction. The discovery of uh, Victoria Falls was by Dr. David Livingston, whereas Lake Victoria is in the northern part of Zambia. That's you are from so the region. You are yeah. from the region, so you know it better. She yes. owns the land. She owns uh, that. Yes. Come again? I say you're the owner of Zambia. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so the Victoria Falls is shared between Zimbabwe and Zambia, and it's fed by uh, a freshwater river called the mighty Zambezi River, okay. where the name Zambia came from. I just wanted to correct that. Thank you very much. We you are, are here to, we stand corrected and we accept. Hold <laughs> and I, 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 yes, Reverend to give Professor land in Zambia, right? Come again. <laughs> so you're going to give our uh, uh, Professor Ben Bogan land because you've already given me land. I don't know about you, so you know, I don't, I don't know about Professor Bongan if he wants even to come to Zambia because once he goes, he's not coming back, and you know that for a fact. Oh, <laughs> I would love to visit. <laughs> yes, I have been seriously <laughs> thinking about it, though. So, you see, Reverend Pam. Yes, I've been, I've been yes. seriously thinking about it. So don't worry, I'll be there. Well, don't worry. We'll, you know we'll all go to Zambia one day, and uh, we'll be living together very harmoniously out there with our freedoms of speech. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, talking about freedom of speech, I want to take this out to Africa. Let's not. I'm, I'm not going to bring in the U.S. right now, because in the United States, for real, we do have those freedoms practiced. Mm -hmm. Those are things that we experience on a daily basis. They're things that we hear, feel, and touch every day. But when you go to African countries, and specifically, I'll talk about the Sadic nations, which, are, which is what I'm very familiar with. I do know about West Africa, Echo was here and there and all that stuff, but let me take it down to my area of comfort. There you go. We have realized, I, personally, I have realized that um, these so-called freedoms of speech are not practiced in Africa when they are. Eh? If and when a person tries to exercise the freedom of speech or freedom of expression, guess what? Especially if these freedoms of expression are against the leader or leaders in that country, these people will disappear. Mm -hmm. If they don't disappear, they are disgraced in public, they are uh, 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 manhandled, they are thrown in jail and 
I mean, just a whole lot of nonsense, rubbish happens to these people mm -hmm. because they are speaking the truth. That's right. They say the truth shall set you free. And every time that I know in my long life as I have lived today, I was born a politician's daughter, by the way, so I know what I'm talking about. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I am a politician's daughter. I was born of a politician. So I lived that life and I saw the life. I was young, but some stuff didn't make sense to me. But as I grew, and of course I went to school and started understanding and now living out of that war fence gate that had, I don't know how many bodyguards and security where you couldn't even see over your own fence. When people spoke their mind or when people expressed themselves, literally those people were either jailed, manhandled, or they disappeared off the thin I mean, the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. So when we come to the United States, and I'm also maybe going to include Canada, the, the, Northern, the Northern Americas, I believe the freedoms are practiced here and they are respected. Because I can say anything I want to say right now about Donald Trump, and nothing's going to happen to me. I've said what I have said. It's off my chest and I go, right? But let me say something about an African leader. Are you guys going to see me tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> it's questionable. Reverend pa, are you going to see me tomorrow? Will you be able to call me tomorrow? No, you won't. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They'll be telling you. They'll be telling you, oh, call. She only, she's only allowed phone calls at 4 o'clock, so call at 4. Uh, five minutes after 4, you cannot speak to her. So technically, uh, our learned professor did make a lot of uh, strategic points and statements that are very, very true from the colonial times. Now, if we have to come to practice our freedoms uh, this, this, in this uh, 21st century, we have to be mindful as well with how we speak and what we say, because all our children are glued to those screens. Our children hear every word that is said or anything that is illustrated on these tubes, the phone, the, 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 the TV, the, the iPads, whatever media communications we have. And most of them, guess what? They repeat what they hear. And as they grow up too, they also come to practice or repeat what they have learned. So we also have to be very mindful about how we use our freedoms or how we stipulate our freedoms. As much as they're given to us in the United States on a silver platter, we still have to be very mindful of about how we express ourselves, lest we get ourselves into trouble. Now, Reverend Pam, you have your say. Yes, I do. <laughs> you know, I, I was born a free princess and I remain a free princess and a servant. Amen. Amen. When I was in secondary school, I went to a, a Cat August Catholic school, Queen of the Rosary, Holy Rosary Secondary School, popularly known as Okoro, Imante closer to the border of Nigeria. I was, I think, maybe 15 years old. There were a lot of government officials. We had, I think it was our 20th anniversary. And during the General Assembly, there were government officials and there were uh, religious leaders from the Catholic Church there. I asked a question. And I was expressing my freedom of speech. I, and not that I knew it was a freedom of speech, but that's, looking back, that's what I was doing. I asked a question. I said, why is it that in Cameroon there's only one political party? The hall went mute. You could hear a pin drop. <laughs> to this day, nobody has responded to that question. And I think people were shocked. The government officials, even the, the Reverend Sisters and the priests there, nobody saw that coming. As a matter of fact, one of my schoolmates reminded me of that question the other day. Everybody was stunned that this little 15 year old girl had the bonus to challenge the political system in the country. I, I am not a politician, but there is freedom of speech. One thing I want to pose to our professor, because you teach uh, 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 journalism, and we, we, are, we are doing this in freedom of speech, freedom of press, even though we're talking mostly about freedom of speech. There is a responsibility that comes with that freedom. Again, that freedom doesn't really exist in, in, in the continent, in Africa. I know, Sylvia, you mentioned the current president. This current president, I'm not so sure you talk about him, he'll look for him to find you. You know, he, 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 he is, let me just forget about him because we, we have a show here. Our show is focused on Africa. But, but there's a responsibility that comes with freedom of speech. The fact that you are free to speak 
even in this country, you cannot just go into a building and scream fire, you'll be arrested. A problem on the continent is that our brothers and sisters, even in the diaspora, when they don't like you, they bow more to you. They say stuff that is not true, and other people pick it up. And I mean, what, what, that to me, they, somebody might say they are expressing their freedom of speech. Freedom of speech doesn't mean that you have the right to make about people. I want Professor Ben to address this. I don't know if, if it is part of your curricula, you know, uh, uh, globally or not. And then I also want Sister Sylvia to chime in if she ever experienced the negative aspects of freedom of speech. Professor, over to you. Oh, thank you, Reverend Pam. In fact, uh, the, the issues you raise are the things I, I've been discussing with my journalism students uh, this semester, as well as uh, other aspects of it with my political science students. Now, okay. le let me start with the, the issue of African countries or other countries that are wrestling with the whole concept of freedom. Uh, it is obvious <coughs> that any government or any entity that uh, has power fears the truth because <laughs> Every time uh, uh, leadership fights, maybe uh, political parties that are vying for, for, for power, anywhere on earth, they are going to do things that they would not like to see in the limelight. If the light is shone on some of the things that politicians do, most of them will hide. So the danger to most political uh, establishments is the truth. And journalists who are supposed to be uh, warriors of the truth, as it were, those who should be exposing the truth, uh, stand therefore as permanent danger to corporations, to, to governments. And when you have, as I started with talking about the United States, the hard fought freedoms that is enshrined in the, in the uh, constitution, very few other countries, especially those that came after colonial, the colonial period, dared to, to go there because they knew that if they put that, it would mean people will be empowered to challenge them. So today you see some constitutions that will make cursory uh, allusions to the idea of freedom, yeah. but they are, they, this is not practice. It is not practice for obvious reasons because it would be exposing. Can you imagine uh, some of our leaders on the continent if the truth about what they do to stay in power were exposed today? Hmm. You know, so that is why uh, the, 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 the structure of the media in our African countries is such that the media does not even have the power. It took forever. Uh, and Asong will uh, support this for us to get a competitive media in Cameroon. It took forever. It's recent. Now, let me just wrap up by pointing to other challenges to the media, uh, to, to freedoms. Besides government that pose the greatest threat to, to freedoms, especially freedom of, of, of individuals to express themselves, freedom of the press to do its work, is the new technologies. The new technologies are a blessing, and I would say a curse, because today, everybody armed with a phone like I have is a broadcaster of their own, and they can yes. say and post almost anything. Yeah. So, so that, that, those are the two major challenges to freedom. The technologies of today and the entrenched governments that don't want to give their citizens the rights that citizens have first by being human beings and being citizens of countries, the right to express themselves. Now, Professor Ben Bongang, we no, grew no, up in our me, day. Me yeah. also. Yes, is there somebody on the line? I, no, I posed the question to Sylvia. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Mm. 
your well, personal uh, experience about growing up and living in the world of <clears throat> the free, freedom of speech and so on? The negative, the negative, <laughs> negative. Uh, side effects of that. Yes, yes. Th that is so very true. Um, growing up, like I said, as a politician's daughter, even till today, when I look at our African countries, um, I notice that our current leaderships in most of our African countries do not allow that practice. You'll find that if it's time for elections and the opponent uh, conjures more uh, of a visibility or, or a viability of his constituents, they become very threatened. They start to disperse them. They start to send cadres after them. They start to tear gas them. They start to uh, pour, uh, what's that, um, uh, from the fire hose uh, water, whatever you call that water. Mm -hmm. They spray the people to, you know, to disperse them. Like uh, 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 Professor Ben has said, <clears throat> most of these, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, yeah. most of these media outlets that we have have come as a blessing too and as a curse. Yeah, because yeah. there's some of this stuff that we will watch on, uh, let's say, YouTube or uh, Facebook. Facebook, yes, hey, whatever, that you will not see in the normal, let's say, Zambian, Zimbabwean, Angolan, Tanzanian newspaper. Mm -hmm. Most of our, 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 our reporters, like the learned uh, professor said, are somehow choked, you understand? They'll yes. be reporting while struggling to stay above water because if I say this, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. If I say that, I'm gonna do that. You see, the news is yes. around them, but they really want to talk and say the truth. So as a journalist, I really commend and compliment the journalists of today because this is the hardest challenge that you guys have, you the teams have, should, should, I, should I say. Because when you report something, sometimes even your lives are threatened. Oh, yes. Your families are threatened. Every time you go out, you have to look behind you. Every time you're driving, you're, you're so much into your rear view mirror, maybe somebody's following. And it's not a comfortable feeling as a journalist to live like that. Mm -hmm. When you leave your house, you keep calling your wife or your husband, oh, how, how's the family? How's the children? The children get to school and so forth and so forth. They need, these leaders need to understand whether you are a standing leader, an opposition leader, or whatever leader you have, human beings are advised or are born with something that's innate in us, and that is called truth. Mm -hmm. Truth should be reported, truth should be disseminated, and lies should be stamped on so that the world can become a better place. The world has become so rotten. I swear, the, the world has become so rotten that even when you step out of the door, you're wondering, am I going to come back tonight? Yes. Because I said, I said this about your Reverend Pam yesterday. Now she's upset that she's upset with me. Not I me. I love you too much. <laughs> I love you too much. You can say yes. whatever you want to say about me. That's right. No, 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 no. You, I know you love me, but I can use I your name without any ramifications after the show to say she called so and so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So yeah. you see, if there was more love among mankind, if it was more love among us, and uh, almost an equal camaraderie of calling you my brother's keeper or my sister's keeper, as, as the saying yeah. goes, this world truly would be a better world. But if we continue also to diminish the importance of journalists, who's going to be giving us that information? Mm -hmm. If we don't support our journalists when they're being attacked or our journalists when they're being maligned or when our journalists are being called liars, who is going to report? These people put their lives in danger. They go on the war front. They go in under the sea. They go above the world in the sky to just report and bring us whatever information they need. But yet, they're not given the respect that they should. Journalists should be what I call Freemasons. You should be out there and just you know, report, report, report like you used to do before. Speak the truth and it shall set you free. <laughs> so yeah. African leaders, stop it. Stop, stop, stop. And let our journalists do their job. You understand? Leave them alone. Let them tell us the truth of everything that's happening in our countries, everything that's happening in the world, and even beneath the world and above the world. Well, those two, those two professors of journalism will, will love you, the two of them. Yes. <laughs> and I love them back. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you so no, much. Uh, let me just uh, add to, yeah, that, Professor Bonga. to say that uh, another challenge is to, to journalism, especially on the African continent, is the fact that uh, the way our governments are set up, there is no access 
to government information for journalists. In other parts of the world, you have uh, within, let's say, the presidency, you have uh, press conferences on a regular basis yeah. where journalists can ask leaders uh, pointed questions about the affairs of the day. In most of our countries, you don't have that. So the way an African journalist would have information would not be a, a direct and transparent way. It might be information that has been secretly got out. Mm -hmm. And this is very unfortunate, you know. Yes. So it is a very, very serious problem, more serious than just the fact that journalists should report. Journalists have to have access to information. They mm -hmm. have access, they have to have access to other sources to verify if the in in information they've got is actually the information that should be disseminated. So you have that, that, that problem to deal with. Then the profession itself, unlike in other places where media houses have the resources to fund the journalists to do their investigative work, most African journalists are, in terms of, of resources, on the lowest scale, in the sense that most of them work for governments, most of them, when they do work for private media houses, and very little money. Mm. But then there are very, there's very little budget for some of these media houses to, for investigation, for reporting. I was uh, in Cameroon a few years ago and I was talking to some of the uh, media, the private media uh, bosses to find out the structure. How is it that they are funding their journalists to do their work? First of all, just talking to some of the journalists, most of them had no training whatsoever. And that is, by my standards, a crime. You cannot expect somebody who likes surgery to, to be performing on patients when he or she has not been to a medical school. And that is the, the situation with some of the journalists at home. They have the enthusiasm, some of these young people I met, but they, they haven't the basics of what it means to report. What does that mean? That means they hear rumors, they, they put them online, and then they expose themselves to be arrested for, for propagating falsehoods. And those, to me, are the real problems of the media on the continent. Yeah, let me uh, jump in here with two uh, quick remarks. I want to not be... Uh, uh, the, the, on the side of everybody, but I wanted to go back to the village in those good old days. We had the town crier. Then gradually uh, we have, uh, gradually we had tabloids, gradually we had radio, gradually exactly. and so on and so forth. Now, Professor Bongan, this one is for you. As, yeah. a, as a lecturer of, as a professor of journalism, how did you make this work? Especially if you went out, let's say you were invited by say Zambia or Burkina Faso, to lecture to students about press freedom. That is one part. The other part is, what if the media had not evolved as they have from the town crier to the newspaper, to the radio, to television, and now social media? What are the, uh, what are the building blocks that we should take into consideration when we look at all these things, uh, all this gamut of stuff out there for us to use? You and I practiced in the good old days. We had our boundaries, we knew what to do and we did it. But today, how do you tell that young boy itching to become a reporter to get into the field, Professor Bonga? Yes, uh, Asom, I go down back to the basics. The basics you and I had in, in journalism schools, which is report the fact. How do you tell a story? You tell a story by going to find out what happened, where, when, how and why. Whether I'm teaching my journalism students uh, in Savannah, Georgia, or my workshop students in Cameroon, the fundamentals of the profession are the starting block. If you can tell a story, how did you get to that story? How can you verify that that story is true? Whatever the platforms that you are going to use, whether you are going to tell your story on Facebook, 
on uh, on on television or uh, writing in the, the newspaper those are the fundamentals then of course when you get into other uh, areas for instance i will be teaching a, a course in the in the spring on how to write columns and editorials and that's another story now where the reporters will know that okay when you've reported on the facts now if you are writing a column it's a different thing you have reported but now you are going to inject mm. your informed opinion yeah. as a columnist and now if you are writing if you are editors say you are going to write or draft the editorial that represents your paper you are not going to sign the the, the editorial as ben bonga it is going to be a, a, an editorial that represents your media organization africa online's editorial will be african online's editorial not the editorial by a reporter in, on africa online but if no, a columnist but if a columnist <laughs> on africa online is writing mm. the, we africa online have selected this person based on their knowledge to be giving their informed opinion as a columnist so the students my students need to know these differences before they do their work but before they get there you must prove to me that you can write a story a story that is well reported the facts have been checked and checked and checked again before it is published yes facts are checked and meticulously checked before they are reported but then in this day and age of the 400 pound guy sitting in his basement and churning <laughs> out stuff what is the best way for you and I the professionals that we were and that we are what should we do to be able to counter fake news if i can use the other guys word yes no words i i think i think that's one of the 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 challenges that we face today as i said earlier the technologies are helping but i think the the real way to combat all of this is go back to what i've just called the fundamentals mm. if you write a story that has been verified and checked uh, the truth will always prevail the truth will always prevail you will have the cacophony of noises on on the whatsapp and on the facebooks and elsewhere but they are so seductive that people will go for them but at the end of the day it is the real story based on facts that will triumph and that's the only way the weapon the, the professionals have is to remain professional not get seduced by the, the the rapid fire of the viral videos and others on the internet I just a, a quick reminder oh yeah yeah is that is that sylvia no I, is that I'm, I'm, go ahead. Oh, okay. I have a question for prof, prof, but go ahead go ahead after sylvia i would yeah, I, I was just going to say uh, given the age of television and the doctoring of stories would franklin roosevelt have survived if he had lived in this day and age professor bonga you remember he had uh, he, he had a problem he had a handicap but the press at that time was so cautious and so careful they never showed the public that he was what he was that he was on a wheelchair that yes. is plausible but today you, you, you see a man limping you report immediately without even taking care of within without, without minding that person's state of mind or what might have happened to him last night so professor bonga i mean where, where are we heading to yeah there, there was a tradition uh in in most countries that journalists were reporting their stories they were reporting things that were of the common good the idea that the person i'm interviewing is on a wheelchair has no direct relevance to the story that i'm writing about uh the idea that uh, john f kennedy has a few girlfriends on the side has no relevance <laughs> on, on the fact that he is yeah. the president yeah. so the reporters at this time it was commonly agreed on them we are reporting stories the news. that are of general interest 
Yes. What people are doing in their private lives have no business for us. But all that has changed. Completely. Because the private lives of public figures are now as they important mm -hmm. as the news. Why? Because the news. they sell the papers. Yes. It started from the entertainment. We wanted to know how uh, Angelina Jolie, what she eats, or what uh, uh, the, the other Hollywood stars do when they are not on walking the carpet. And because that is selling papers and it's of interest, prurient interest for people. So that is why those things are, have blurred the line between traditional journalism and tabloid journalism. There was a reason why we called it tabloid journalism. Tabloid journalism was the entertainment for the grocery stores where little stories in the village were, were, were written and people never took that seriously. But now the line is so blurred that I even uh, I tell my students, my, our university newspaper, Tiger Road, I say, please do not write about what I do, which has nothing to do with <laughs> my book as a professor. Yes, yes. Yeah. that's right. But those are the stories that people want to read about today. It's unfortunate, but we've got to adapt. We've got to continue teaching the students about the fundamentals. And when and if I do get to do the workshop back in Cameroon that have failed the last couple of years, that is exactly what I'll be telling them. Because no, prof, Asong, you yes. and I have an obligation to, to help the young colleagues back home so that the profession doesn't die. Yes, indeed. Yes, I, I was going to uh, inject this other aspect to it of uh, the BBC, a, a, a renowned world uh, broadcaster, who recently planted uh, people in Ghana and Nigeria to do something which I know is possible to go into universities and not report yeah. the news about the universities, but these professors who were preying on their female students, what in Cameroon we used to call sex for max. So oh. is, this, is this a plausible thing to do to plant reporters in places where we think uh, uh, sins are being committed or where we think news is being derailed and instead pleasures are being sought? No, that that is, is, is really important that you bring that up because, again, that is one of those gray areas. I actually listened to, to the show and, and here's uh, what happened. You have what we will call activist journalists uh, or those who are investigating wrongdoing, like in this case. They, they were not, uh, even if they were BBC uh, reporters, the, the documentary was meant to expose a problem, which is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And the BBC took that editorial uh, decision to, to broadcast it the way they did. As an editor, I probably would have not done it this, the way they did. But it also reflects the times because the editors today are probably younger than you and I, and they are also uh, being dragged into, into the competitive nature of the media space today. People want to come out with the kind of stories that are going to shake things up as it were. Things, uh, especially in this case, they are self-righteous in the sense that they are going to say, we expose evil, we expose evil. But they, because other questions come up to mind, how, did you infringe on the privacy of the person you recorded without their consent? So those are things that uh, the laws have to, to address. Yes. You know? uh, Sylvia or Reverend Pam, question for Prof? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Reverend, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Sylvia. Ask, uh, ask Professor whatever you want to ask him. Uh -huh. Uh, just going back a little bit on the same um, issue of uh, privacy and investigative reporting, where you plant a mole uh, uh, amidst uh, 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 the area that you want to operate in. For example, I was reading this morning, very, very devastating news for me as a mother. 
and as a grandmother, where a school in Zambia had a hundred students uh, uh, in, in sexual acts in a house, I believe that is on the school property. Oh, no. now, now these kids were arrested. Well, some, some, some ran, there were 70, seven zero were arrested, but the other 30, I believe ran away. Now, as parents, I believe we have a social responsibility towards our children and the world at large. When your child commits such a crime and you just like give him a slap on the hand, okay, go back to school. Professor, how are we going to have our children educated the proper way, the way you and I went to school, the way you and I studied hard and we did not buy grades, we did not pay for any diploma, we did not pay for anybody to, to pass us in, 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 in any classes that we have. For us as women, Reverend Pam, we never had to sleep with any professors, for professors to pass us. No. How how are we going to protect our children? Because now our children, both boys and girls, you understand, are consenting from age 11. Um, from age 11 going up, so long as their periods have started, some of them even start as early as eight, but I hate to think that an eight-year-old will be uh, going into that, but I'm going by the newspaper report that I read this morning that really devastated me. From age 11, these kids are consenting. What can we do as reporters or as journalists that is going to help these children that are already involved in these, the, uh, let me call it promiscuity for a better word or sexual acts for a better choice of words. Mm -hmm. Because as a mother, it concerns me, my grandkids are going to school now. Should I always be sitting and worrying? Is there anything that our journalists can do to alleviate the worries of a grandmother like me? You know, the, the world today is, is a dangerous place a dangerous place in the sense that uh, the children have access to all yes. these images that are flooding the internet. And parents, and I know any self-respecting parent has had this fight of trying to limit access to, to some of the, the, the internet to the children, but it's a losing battle. It's a losing battle. So what should we do? I think it begins at home in the sense that every parent, every parent has to do their utmost. You can limit as much as you have, but it is possible that the children will still access certain things. But I think that when the children realize from home that you are protecting them, you are trying to help them, we might gain some, some of them might go. Now, the, 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 the public media also has the responsibility to know that there are certain stories, there are certain movies, there are certain reports that are so explicit that you have to at least let the viewers know before that children, young children should not watch that. And it will be up to the parents to stop them. But I would say for certain today that, that we've lost that battle already. So no. we have to just do what we can to limit exposure, you know. Yeah, the unfortunate I, I, I mean, thing, dear Prof, the, the unfortunate thing, let me just say this, is that many of us parents have become too busy with the world that yeah. we no longer focus on the home. We're Absolutely. more concerned about what is out there than what is happening right at, at, at our noses, in our homes, in our houses. Mm -hmm. Some parents go for 16 of 24 hours. When do they have the time to check on the children at home, to control what the children are watching or doing at home? And then of course we know that without that control, without that concern from parents, anything can happen. And as they say in sexual harassment, the person who touches your child is the closest person to you, known to you, mm. known in your neighborhood. It's unfortunate. So we really just have to stay alert and do all we can to make sure that we do not let our words out there to lose, in, to get lost in society. Uh, let me jump in here. I want to say something to encourage me then. We haven't lost that battle. You, you see, and, and, and uh, I, I want to encourage all the parents, both on the continent and in the diaspora, basically anybody under the sound of my voice. This is the thing. If you're going to take time and make those babies, you need to make time to raise those babies and train them. 
it comes with a responsibility. There are people that spend money on fertility drugs, try to adopt children, looking for children. God has blessed you with a child or children. It is your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of the church or the school or the police. It is, or the journalists. It's your responsibility primarily to raise those children. Look, in Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child the way they should go, and when they grow up, they will not depart from it. It starts from home. It starts from home. You start training them from when, I mean, from one year old to year old. It starts from, from the home. And there are parents in this country that are the, the, either on WhatsApp or, 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 or Facebook or watching ESPN uh, uh, and uh, watching sports. The mother is on social media, and the child is looking, communicating with pedophiles on, on the internet because parents don't have time. No, no, they don't have the interest. It's not the time. There are also parents that work 24 hours a day or 30 hours a day, and you're working to, 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 to make money. You do what with it when the child that God has blessed you, the children that God has blessed you with, the devil is raising them or some pedophile. There are parents that don't even know what is happening with their children. They don't know. And then tomorrow they want, they want to blame the church or the school. No, it starts with you. I, I, I am sorry, you have to make time. That money that you are working to do or uh, to raise, as you are making uh, over time, I think it's also a deducting over time. Keep that in mind. So please, if you cannot raise these children, don't make them. I don't care if you are married, don't make those children if you're not gonna raise them. It's, it's your responsibility. And I, 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 I wanna ask a question um, to me, Ben, and to Sister Sylvia, and we are coming to the top of the hour, so you can answer the question after the top of the hour. Is this thing about freedom of speech? There are people that just concoct stories. I'm talking about concoct stories, not even twisting a story, just making up something to tarnish you, to destroy your reputation. In this day and age, in this digital age, when, when, when you meet somebody, the first thing they do is they look at the little I want to encourage everybody, don't believe everything you read on the internet about people. Please don't. Because some of us don't have time to be rebuttaling things or scrubbing the internet. Some people are just too busy doing the good things. They don't have time for negativity. But in this day and age, from, there are people, even journalists, because we know lies sells and negativity sells and sex sells. There are journalists, some of them are not even journalists. Some of them are self-appointed journalists. Some of them are eye reporters. Some of them are just regular uh, 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 people with, with their phone. They, they, and some people are just excited about social media. They just start spreading stuff. They, they, they put somebody's voice on something that is not them. They, they, they put somebody's picture on, on something that is not even the, the person. And a lot of times, the victims don't even know, it, know about it. And even when the victims know, the victims don't even have a way of fighting it. So if you can quickly respond to this at the top of the hour, we have three minutes. I'll be back with the announcement. Uh Ben and then as a journalist, as a civil, but we'll all take turns because I, I, we have three minutes for the top of the hour. So I'll interrupt whoever is speaking. Yes. Right. yes. What? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Professor Bonga will come after you. All right. What I would say to that is, uh, unfortunately, you did mention um, uh, you don't have time to go on the internet to rebuttal. The way social media works these days is the only way you can clear your name. If I do a video attaching whatever allegations were made towards you or about you, embedding that video to support yourself and say, this was not me, this is not my video. This is the real truth, Sylvia Robertson, and what was said about me is not true. That's the best way I can advise on this one because social media is going haywire. And if you don't do that, people will keep thinking that the allegations posted, posted or posed against you were true when they're actually not true. So defend yourself in whichever way you can, post your own personal video, post your own personal picture and rebuttal whatever information or erroneous information that was published about you. Uh, thank you, Bunga. Ben, before, you, yeah. before you, you weigh in, before you weigh in, Ben, because I want you to respond to this part. Okay, Sister Steven, that's a good idea, but it will be, it, 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 that would work if it, the, the damage could be con contained. Okay, the people who are spreading the negative news, because negative news sells, you know, like I've yeah. said this before on the show, and somebody once said that 
uh, bad news goes around the neighborhood three times before new, uh, good, good news puts on his shoes. So mm -hmm. you can do your own video, the perpetrators and, 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 and the, the haters, you know, and the gossipites and the jealousites and all the invites, all these people that spread those negativity about you. Even when they see the rebuttal, when they see the truth, they will not forward it. WhatsApp is a is a biggest corporate. People forward stuff. Somebody forwarded a, 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 a video to me and some some naked. I, and I, I didn't even open it because it's when it came. I saw I just want the person. I said I don't read garbage and I don't have time for it. I said, please don't send this to me. You know, there are people who don't have time, but they don't have anything better to do but to spread negativity. Maybe you have two minutes before the top of the hour. Yes, I think uh, things will get worse, probably. If at yeah. all, they will get better afterward. <laughs> because the technologies are improving. Uh, we, we have now editing equipment for our students. And they can do amazing things with video. And with the AI, artificial intelligence that is coming, things will get even worse. Where mm. you will have complete fabrications of some image that looks like you with, with the voice mm. and it will be very tough to fight against something that looks really like you sound like you but <laughs> it would have been fabricated that is what we are facing which is which is as scary as it comes but again the uh, at least here in the united states we can only go back to the laws there, you know, the laws are there to protect us. And the moment that you are attacked, and there is evidence of that, we have no choice but to go to the laws. But of course, imagine the damage when, when it is done already. If you remember the last several years, we'd say the struggles in any of our countries, including Cameroon, people were confounded by the images they saw, it was difficult to separate which of these images are real, which are the ones that have been taken from other places. So, and that is in the absence of true reporting, from the, the, the absence of credible media sources, we had no choice but to look at some of these and it's up to you to say, okay, what do I believe? And okay, guess what I'm happened? People were um, believing the things they wanted to believe and rejecting those they didn't want to reject. But that's not how we should be dealing with facts. Selective watching, selective reading, selective uh, watching, and so on. Let me repeat myself. Unfortunately, it is happening that way. So Reverend Palm, I think we're at the top of the hour. And uh, usually at this time from Houston, we hear your voice announcing something special. Yeah, th thank you so much. And uh, just for the record, uh, and Ben, I, I, I can see you. You're not on the big screen because I think your, your audio is on one device and your video is on the other device. But uh, Sister Sylvia, can you see Professor Ben? Yes, I can. Yes. Very handsome. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. How come you didn't tell me I'm very beautiful? Thank you. Sister Pam, am I going to tell you every time I see you? Am I going to tell you every time I see you? You're already beautiful and you know it. I told you the first thing. I, I, I do know it. I know it. Thank you. I'm just like, okay. Well, it's about the hour, you know. Um, I am so excited about our next topic because I love to cook. I really love to cook. We know Thanksgiving is coming up on November the 28th. So we're going to have two of our beautiful sisters here, Dr. Najela Nukuna. Uh, who, I mean, this this woman, when you see her, you don't want to go to the gym, you know? She doesn't have any fat on her body, you know? And she wrote a, a, a cookbook for African cuisine, and uh, she's helped a lot of Africans, you know, lose weight, you know, with um, her program. And then uh, Dr. B. Tazong also, um, uh, she is a, a life lifestyle coach. So both of them are going to be on, on the program next week. Uh, on the uh, the WhatsApp group, they will both uh, take questions on the WhatsApp group. Uh, Dr. Bitazon is a medical doctor. Dr. Najela is a, um, a chemist. She has a PhD in chemistry, I believe. You know, and uh, I bet both of them have graciously uh, agreed. So we're going to be talking about uh, how not to gain weight during over the holidays. Uh, uh, to eat clean African food. You know, starting this because we know from November. Through, through uh, New Year's Eve, we don't stop eating. 
And we're also going to encourage our, our viewers and participants to send us their Thanksgiving meals on Thanksgiving Day. So Nia Song, Chief Editor, Executive Editor, take note. Uh, on Thanksgiving Day, we're going to allow people, because on the forum, we don't allow people to pay, post videos or anything because we don't want to inundate people's phone. But on Thanksgiving Day, and yeah, so we're going to allow participants to share their pictures of their Thanksgiving meal. I would actually, if I can get somebody to record me, I'm going to be sharing um, my, my, my amazing turkey recipe. You know, I do jerk, you know, I, 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 I Jamaican jerk turkey. I've done that for the last 15 years. I always have at least I make a lot of turkey. People always keep them down to the bones. I'm going to be sharing the recipe with my brothers and sisters. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to you and uh, I need to uh, go on mute for a few minutes. Now, me. before you go on mute, are you going to also show us that Sese Coco special? I'm not doing Sese Coco. I'm going to be doing jerk, <laughs> jerk turkey. I'm going to be doing banana cornbread. I'm going to be doing uh, coconut and uh, uh, red velvet cake. And of course, I'm going to have. What some... happened to Ndole? What happened uh, to the. Uh, <laughs> go. I'm going to be making Ndole. That's my too. favorite. Uh, okay, That's I, right. I, just because of you, I will share the Ndole recipe. And yes, Amen. I, I, Amen. My Ndole is in a class by itself. Yes, I'm bragging. I don't care. I, I, I'm okay. bragging because I, I, growing up, I was never in the kitchen. The Lord anointed me to cook, so I give him all the glory. Over to you, Mia. Now, Professor Bongam, we're back on our topic. Uh, freedom of speech. I think we've covered most of the bases, but then we still have a few worrying things, what to do, especially for Africa. We know that these technologies are like fish in water swallowed with uh, the, the, the bait and the hook are all swallowed by everybody in the, on the continent. They don't shift uh, the good from the bad or from the ugly. They just take anything and everything they see on social media. What and how can we tackle this to better inform the people on the continent to stay safe and especially for our daughters? And no, I, th I think I will go even further to say governments have the responsibility to begin to establish what I would call a political culture that expands and promotes democracy. What does that mean? That means we need to begin to build the habits in citizens to understand that the love of country is not only reserved to, to the leaders, that the love of country is the responsibility of everybody. And yeah. therefore, every citizen must participate. And how can we participate without knowing what is going on? So what should governments do? Governments should begin by asking the leadership in place, what do we want our countries to be in the next 25, 50 years? Are we going to continue treating our own citizens this way? Can we look at the, what we call constitutions and rewrite them, not only to have things on paper, but to say they are fundamental freedoms that help every society to develop. And one of these is the freedom of expression and the freedom of the press. Because if a country is free, it means the people are free. And the leadership of the, uh, any country has the responsibility to ensure that people are happy and seek prosperity without fear, without fear of government. Government should not be a threat to individual citizens' lives. But how do you guarantee that without, as a country, coming to the table to say, let us have the courage to create systems of checks and balances. And that it is okay that after four or five years as a leadership, that we let the, the others take over so that we can see what they too can do. But what has been happening on the continent has made it almost impossible 
for the press to express itself. And that going back to your to your fundamental question, we can only as the media perform well if the structures are allow us to do so, if the laws allow us to do so, if media owners accept that beyond making money, they also have a civic responsibility, which is for the truth. And to do so, they have to invest in the training of their journalists. That said, we know that governments say one thing and turn around and do another. We know that media <laughs> practitioners, for lack of funding, cannot go the nine yards to do the full job, the, resp the responsible way they ought to. We know that society is judgmental and they do selective reading, selective listening, and they only choose that which pleases them or that which is uh, good for them. So generally speaking, the African tends to ignore things that are important to them. What and how can we go ahead, apart from government, apart from you and I, the uh, trench uh, dwellers, what can we do better that we're not doing to encourage parents, especially, I keep insisting on parents, so that they know that even though there are laws, even though there are freedoms, we have limits and that we should also take the responsibility of ensuring that we take care of our neighbor and our neighbor takes care of us so that together we build a community of, uh, uh, of people that understand each other and know that finger pointing is not the best way to go. I think we, we are already doing, doing that here because Africa Online is already educating what we're, we're you know, letting people know that these subjects are very important and we need to be talking about them. Yeah, was, uh, we've been talking a lot about government, but I think that uh, the responsibility lies on civic society. That is the individuals like you and I, the organizations like Africa Online, our various civic organizations to which we belong, the Jangi houses and all the other non-governmental entities that we create, we should not undermine the ability or the capacity of these entities to move things forward. Because sure. we, they, these groups can push forward agendas that will bring about change. Because we tend to look too much up to governments. Governments have failed and failed woefully in most African countries. But civic society organizations, uh, focusing on individuals, focusing on families, focusing on groups can begin to educate and help move forward. Sylvia, your take on this. Uh, I know you go back to Zambia once in a while. When you go back there, what do you tell the guy on the, at the street corner who is not doing the right thing media-wise? Well, you know me, Professor, my mouth doesn't stop at nothing. So when I see wrong, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Wrong is wrong and right is right. So unfortunately for me, I'm known as a lady who doesn't stop at nothing. I'm like, I'm a trailblazer. I, I love to speak the truth and I like to make a correction if I can back my, my findings to say that what he, he or she, like Professor had said earlier on, we have to thrive on the truth. So as a parent or as an individual, as a private citizen, it's always in our best interest to correct our children, even though our children these days are so disrespectful, they're very honorary, they're belligerent. When you try to correct them, they'll tell you, you're not my mama, you're not my papa, you cannot tell me what to do or what to say. But you know what? The Reverend had quoted to train up a child. If we train our children the right way from the get-go, even if they deviate, sometimes it's not at a complete 180 degrees. It's probably at a 45 degree or 25 degree angle. And we can still work with them and bring them back to, to, to the right uh, to the arena. Now, there are some of them who are far, far gone because either one, they did not have the right upbringing. Two, they just wanted to be rebellious. You know, uh, children are children. They're individuals with their own perspective, with their own beliefs, with their own wants, likes, dislikes, and so forth. You can teach a child to PhD level or whatever is above PhD level. If he doesn't want to practice what he learned, can you force him? No, you no. can't. You can't force him. So 
we let individuals be individuals, but as much as we admonish, we chastise and stuff like that, we also have to use the other hand to pacify the person that we're talking to. Because anytime you go lashing out at somebody and say, oh, you lied, hey, professor, this is not what I was, you said about me. How do you think the professor is going to respond to me? He's going to lash back at me too. So we also have to learn now the patience of mankind also has to kick in to where when we find that there's a wrongdoing, we sit this person, individual, individuals, or even the leadership and see how we can talk to them so that we can find our, ourselves again on the straight and narrow. We need to bring our reporters back to uh, the, the middle because they are finding so many challenges today that they can't do their jobs right. They are finding, like I said earlier, on so much backlash today that they can still do, do their jobs right. They're doing their best, like Professor said, not enough money, not enough resources, but yet here they are trying to give us the truth. So as private citizens as well, it is our duty as individuals, like the, look at the program you started right now. What are we doing right now on this program? We're trying to teach the truth about what's going on. We're trying to tell the truth about what, journal, what journalism is or what journalists go through to do their jobs. Now, how many people are gonna watch this? Probably 10,000, 15, 20,000 people. Somebody may come up with a bright idea and say, hey, prof, uh, this is what you said the other day, I'm thinking ABC. Oh yeah, for the AI uh, prof, you said this, this is what I'm thinking for the ABC. Let me give uh, $10,000 to this uh, online uh, station that you all are doing because I want the truth to be propagated. We need to hold hands. We need to be there for one another and we need to correct ourselves with love. Don't always admonish and not give back, you know, in a sweet smile and say, okay, I know you messed up, but uh, let's do it right the next time. I think as that. much as you buy it, also blow. As much yeah. as you buy it, also blow. So, yes. Prof, yeah. when, on that line of thinking. Yeah. No, I think I, I, I support Sylvia, and, I'm, and I think that we should also show the good examples to our, uh, to, to, to our young people especially. Because there's nothing that teaches better than a good example. We have from our history, our traditions, examples of how to live a good life. So we should be exposing as counter narratives, these good examples so that our children can see something better than all of this that is flooding the internet. So it is up to us to curate as it were, to find what is it, we are having a Thanksgiving dinner and we are resting. What can we watch? which will be uplifting to the three generations of the family than just anything that will fall on, on the internet. So it has to be deliberate, deliberate on the part of parents, especially these younger parents, to see that the children will, will copy the good examples if you keep, keep feeding them those examples all the time. Habits, the building of good habits, has to be a deliberate uh, program, a deliberate uh, mission, not only by the parents, by, by, but by the village. By the village, I mean all of us who are related to people raising children. It has to be a concerted village effort where we say we have meetings. How do we teach the children good habits? And can we as adults identify some good habits that our little group wants to instill. Let me take the example of uh, our group here in Savannah. We call it Cameroonian in Savannah. But we've also invited other Africans because as far as I'm concerned, we belong together. You know, so we have Rwandans in the group, uh, Chadians and uh, Kenyans uh, in that group, uh, Liberian as well. No but, Zambians. Yes. So we, we, <laughs> we decided uh, because we had, you know, the elderly, when we are done in, in a month, as adults, we want to eat and drink and be happy. But something occurred to me because I love to read. And I said, what are, are we doing to get our children to read? So I called the kids. We had a, a, all of them sat in the living room. And I showed $20. 
and I said every month during the meeting, I will give $20 to the person who has read the most books. So it is now our tradition. Every month, I, I, my, my purse diminishes by $20. <laughs> but I love it. I yes. love to see that $20 disappear because all of a sudden, I am noticing that kids are jumping to say, oh, grandpa, I read 10 books. I read 20 books. It has blown my mind. So yes. the point of the story is that we should build habits. We should build good habits in our kids. It, is, it takes time, but we have no choice. We have no choice whatsoever. We must do it. Unfortunately, Prof, uh, we have uh, some of the uh, biggest shots in the world who are doing just the opposite of what you are doing, encouraging kids, encouraging people in the society. They tweet a thousand times a second. They say things with both sides of their mouth. And children are listening to these things. Children are reading these things. How do we counter such prominent personalities doing things like this to our very own children and world? Awesome. That is a wonderful thing we need to discuss. <laughs> Because when, when children today listen to leaders, leaders who are leaders of the world, saying things that they don't expect adults to say, it puts us, us in, it gives us a wonderful opportunity. What I would say, a teaching moment, where you would have to educate a child now to say, adults also make mistakes. Adults can also say dumb things. This, for instance, is a dumb thing, and this is why. This is wrong. Even if it is coming from your teacher, even if it's coming from grandpa, even if it is coming from the president of the United States, it is wrong. Wrong is wrong, and it doesn't matter who is saying what is wrong. So we should seize those opportunities and use them as opportunities to educate the children. Now, there, is the, there was a concern on the uh, WhatsApp group during the week. Somebody, I think, raised the issue of uh, those behind news uh, choosing the way they color their news. Of course, it is their right. But also reporting only those things that are of pleasure to them, not what they think is of pleasure to the entire community. Uh, can we satisfy everybody in the society? No. No. Okay. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Sylvia. Yeah, that I, was Sylvia. Yeah, Sylvia. Yeah. Go ahead, please. <laughs> you you can satisfy everybody in society in, in the society based upon what you report. It's like in a family, in a marriage, you get married. Does every in-law like you? No. Huh? Is huh, every you wish. <laughs> wish. That's Reverend Pam. <laughs> does every in -law, uh, Reverend Pam? Does every in-law like you? No, they don't. Mm -hmm. So even when you speak, sometimes it's like, look at that sister, you know, the way she talks, she's got, yeah, 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 she's got so that accent and all that. Mm -hmm. Yes. If I'm trying yeah. to put, uh, please the entire family, I'll die before my, my age of enjoying my husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my, my response to this one is this. With uh, regards to uh, 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 how you call satisfying the community, if I know that the news I'm disseminating is the truth and nothing but the truth. I don't care who says what. Because if they come back to me with that same news or report that I sent, I can defend it and say, yes, it's the truth and nothing but the truth. Like it or not, truth is truth. Now, you realize that when you tell the truth, you repeat yourself over and over and over, almost saying the same words repeatedly for the same truth that you're speaking. But when you lie, you now start to say, search for words. What did I say the last time? Or what did I say this time? And things like that. So even when a, a person comes, you know, comes at you with that anger or with that devastation of you said and he said, they said, we all said and nobody said, you stand your ground and you say, yes, this is what I said. Take it or leave. Okay, now, Professor Bonga, just hold on your thought for a while. We have okay. one of our regulars, Dr. Ogoji on the line. He lives in Spokane uh, in the Northwest of the United States. So I believe uh, he's been able to dial in now or zoom in. Uh, Dr. Ogoji, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Sorry for dialing in late. <laughs> it's all right. At least you're on the show. Hey, Doc. How are you? We're talking good. about freedom of speech. Yeah. 
So what is your take? Well, freedom of speech is very, very important, okay? However, there is a limit. What is freedom of speech? And how do you differentiate freedom of speech from hate crime? Um, um, hate crime and um, character assassination. People say what they think, but um, it all depends on how you look at it. The fact is that freedom of speech should be something that is genuinely it must be true, it must be a fact, and it must be fair to all concerned. It doesn't matter who, if something, if something is wrong, it's wrong, something is right, it's right. But the point is this, human beings are known to be very biased that um, any amount of freedom of speech you have, must, there must be some element of bias. Uh, a typical example is, look at the media we have in the United States, Everybody thinks Fox News is for the Republican Party, why NBC is for the Democratic Party, why some people claim CNN is biased. But again, all this depends on who's interpreting the news and what they are saying. Um, it's something that we, the listeners, have to look at the list of the news very well and take out what we think is right and what is not right. Because when somebody is presenting an issue to anybody, the way the person presenting the person is biased in what he's saying. It took it for myself, for example, if I'm talking to somebody about something, a type of procedure or a medication, the way I present it, by the time I'm done, the patient knows what I'm leaning to us. That goes to say with journalism and every other thing we do. So it all depends on let the facts, people decide what to do, but it's a very tough thing to appreciate what is freedom of speech, what is biased speech, and what do people really intend, what they are trying to pass along. Professor, go ahead if you are ready, because we are wrapping up. We are towards the end of the program. We have the last seven minutes or so. So please let us begin to put our thoughts together. So Professor Bongan, I know you are the lead guest, but uh, we wouldn't mind going with you first. Uh, give yes. us your last words on the topic, press or uh, freedom of speech. Yes, I, I think that uh, we, we, it's been an opportunity for us to look at the challenges for, uh, of, uh, of freedoms, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And uh, freedom of speech, as we said at the top of the program, is that ability for individuals to express themselves without fear of powerful entities like government. And freedom of the speech is uh, that uh, the guarantees for the media to write and publish content without fear that governments will censor them. But the point of the first is that today, in, uh, as uh, different from a long time ago, you, the, 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 the society is flooded with so many voices, with so many media outlets, most traditional media outlets had what we call gatekeepers, editors and others who made sure that the stories that were published were well-researched stories, well-reported stories. But today, everybody armed with a device that can transmit, can write a story and can even put pictures online, yeah. video, some of it that is uh, manufactured and fabricated. So those are the challenges. But then every country today has to do what normal countries do, which is when different uh, uh, things happen, when there are changes in societies, you make laws that address those changes. But be careful not to diminish the, the rights of the citizens. Well, there's one aspect that we did not address, but I hope we can uh, maybe chip in on uh, online. Uh, what about the security of the reporters? Some reporters we said in the beginning disappear simply. Some are arrested and jailed. Some are arrested and put in jail, but never tried. So what are we going to tell governments? Because those are the people that do these things. What, are we, what can we tell them in a word by, by each of us here gathered uh, this afternoon? Basically, I think I would uh, like to go back to what Professor Bong had said before, 
it comes into the constitution. It's gotta be a constitutional declaration that all these uh, reporters and uh, journalists and so forth are protected by the laws of that country or by the governance of that country. Because if these, if these uh, reporters and, and, and uh, interviewers and so forth are going into the countries without that protection, most of them are not gonna come out telling the truth because a lot of them are intimidated and a lot, of, a lot of them are threatened. Because if you say this, then this happens. If you say that, that happens to your family. So I believe from uh, what the professor had said just from his opening statement, these countries and their constitutions have to be amended in, a, in such a way that the, 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 the reporters uh, that come into uh, do investigative reporting or just regular reporting into any country in the world should be protected. Thank you. Dr. Ogoji, one last word before we go. Well, um, again, um, freedom of speech is um, very important. Um, um, the government should stay off speech, uh, let people say what they want to say without fear of being harassed. Um, but there should, there should also be censorship of the press and media because um, um, it amazes me when I listen to people talk about the same topic in the news. Um, you wonder if they're saying the same thing. Yeah. The same topic we discuss, two different views, are they talking about the same issue? Yeah. That's when we, the masses, have to filter out and see what's going on, you know? So it's a very tough topic. The government makes the laws, but the masses decide what is real. Unfortunately for the masses, the handy devices has made things worse because things just go out there without knowing the source. <laughs> As the professor just said, that's the biggest part of it. So we shouldn't believe things we see on a, in a non-official, unofficial media, like WhatsApp and all those uh, apps. We should rely on the news, but listen with them with a pinch of thought, with a pinch of uh, salt, because it's different. If I want to hear something about the propaganda, I go to Fox News, I hear something. The same thing in, in uh, CNN is a completely different topic. It amazes me. So it's, it's made to decide what is real and what's not real. And how can government protect the press and the people from saying their mind? Reverend Pam, your last word on the topic. I'll make this quick. When you open your mouth to speak, or you pick your pen to write, or you get on your keyboard to email, or type, or text on your device, ask yourself if this is going to lift somebody up, edify somebody, bring somebody comfort, or if it's going to destroy somebody or kill somebody. The responsibility is yours. May I say? The last word is, would things have been different if Pilate had waited for the answer to the question, truth, what is truth? And had Jesus given the answer? He is the truth. So that is right. On that note, we're going to draw the curtain on today's program. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Reverend Palm. Thank you, Dr. Ogoji. Thank you for our Professor Ben Bonga. Please have a good evening. And next week, we'll be talking Thanksgiving and eating slim. Oh, is it eating? <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. And bye. Thank you very much for the honor. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much.